Hello, and welcome to The Entrepreneurial Musician, a newsletter, coaching service, podcast, and blog preparing today's musicians for tomorrow's realities. This is TEM 291 titled, Five Mistakes You're Making When Applying for Grants. Thank you to Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for TEM. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please, if you would like to make me happy, sign up for the Portfolio Career Playbook, a newsletter from TEM Coaching. I'm not sure why that was the selling point, because why do you care if some guy on the internet is happy? Anyway, uh, the Portfolio Career Playbook is a newsletter from TEM Coaching geared specifically towards any musician balancing the many different aspects of a portfolio career. Here's what you missed in last week's quartet of ideas. If you have not joined the entrepreneurial musicians who have already subscribed, let's see. There was uh, an article on the nine most popular types of social media content in 2023, uh, and it was all like data driven. Uh, I have actually scaled back on my social media, and so it's really nice for me to be able to see uh, where my efforts are going to be most beneficial, and then lining that up with where my audience is, and then where my interests lie, and there that made a clear path forward for me. I'm not trying to maintain quite as many channels as I did before, because life is too short. Uh, an article on cultivating calm and the science of cultivating calm and talks about how breathing is basically like the operating manual for our nervous system. And I found that article really helpful because uh, when I struggle, I need to breathe. And when things are going well, I need to breathe. And it's just, it helps every aspect of my career. Uh, five tips to make a fascinating YouTube channel trailer. I've been kind of going through learning about YouTube and there are a lot of things. Nothing is complicated. It's just you have to put a lot of time and care into, uh, into a YouTube channel. And I decided that if I'm going to be on YouTube that I need to be doing it right. And so I've been kind of ramping that up. And then uh, lastly was something from the TEM blog called Avoidance Then Trial and Error. And um, it features uh, actually a sub 30 second clip from uh, the Brass Junkies, which has absolutely this clip has nothing to do with brass at all. Uh, but it's uh, it basically sums up the entire artistic journey in one sub 30 second clip. And uh, I couldn't believe how many parallels there were with the business side of my career uh, with this great quote from uh, an incredible young musician named Jazzy Piggott. So that's what you missed, and then also a, a quote on uh, on actually being unreasonable in a good way, and about how that's a good way to kind of make waves. So you can go to signup.tem.fm to get this week's uh, quartet of ideas and to uh, not miss any moving forward. Thank you to everybody who's already done so, because that makes me happy, and it's all about me now, isn't it? Tem two ninety one, three mistakes you're making with your grant proposals. I am honored to sit on the board of directors of the Mockingbird Foundation, which is a 501c3 that has awarded over 500, I believe now, uh, grants over the years to uh, support music education in all 50 states across the United States of America. Uh, at one point, I was actually the, um, the head of the grant-making committee, so I was in charge of the committee that decided where the money went and how much, uh, etc., and I am still a member of that committee. I'm just not in the leadership role anymore uh, because uh, we, we turnover is healthy in all organizations, but that's, uh, that's for a different podcast. Uh, point is that I have read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grant proposals over the years, and uh, I've seen some really, really well-executed ones and some really poorly executed ones. Uh, and I just want to be clear, I'm not criticizing the people who have applied to the Mockingbird Foundation. Some that we get are absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, it is a person who's the only music teacher at some school that has absolutely no money. They're just out of school. They barely, it's incredible that they even had the wherewithal to apply for a grant. So I'm not saying they should all be polished. And in fact, that's not even the point here. You're not going to hear the any of the five mistakes is not, it's not super polished as if written by a professional. Uh, and sometimes it would actually be kind of a weird red flag for us if it was super polished from some really small school. Something wouldn't add up there. We would definitely do some digging. So not being critical of the, the ones that have come into the Mockingbird Foundation, but it has allowed me to see across the entire spectrum of, of really thoughtfully done almost no thought put into it and then everything in between. And so I thought that I would 
offer up the five most common mistakes that I have seen both within my time at Mockingbird being on the receiving end, but also with TEM coaching clients, uh, et cetera. Mistake number one, you are centering your proposal around your needs rather than the needs of the organization you are applying to. Okay, you're thinking, possibly, what the hell does that mean? Like, I'm the one who needs the money. I need to go and execute this thing that I spell out, and that's why I'm making the grant proposal in the first place. So here's the thing, is that when we are deciding, as a part of the Mockingbird Foundation, what we are going to fund and what we are not, the only thing that we are concerned with is our fiduciary responsibility, which is a fancy, and I'm... I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an expert on this, so I'm going to get the definition almost correct, but please don't email me if you are an expert in this. But our fiduciary responsibility means that we are legally obligated to to only be funding things that are directly support our mission, okay? And so if your proposal supports our mission, you're actually doing us a favor by contacting us. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, but second of all, all that we're concerned about legally and just ethically is executing our mission. And that is why it is really important that you figure out, which is actually going to lead me to mistake two. These are could be 1A and 1B. That was just going to get kind of a little bit confusing. Mistake number two is you aren't spending enough time researching the grant that you're applying for and the organization that you are applying to for that grant. You need to be very specifically addressing the needs of the organization that you are applying to. If there is something that that organization um, does or that is a, a main part of their mission that speaks to you, then you absolutely have to not just mention that in passing, but you need to highlight that fact. And, and if there's no overlap on that Venn diagram, there's almost no chance that you're going to get the grant anyways. And so you probably shouldn't be applying in the first place. And so you have to figure out exactly what it is that this grant is going for as well. Read the actual uh, the, the grant application. Use the words that are in that grant application. You can figure out what outcomes they are trying to fund. And then you need to speak to those outcomes and to that organization. I know that this seems obvious, but I cannot tell you how often grant proposals can resemble a non- a moving request to be interviewed on TEM, of which I've had like three guests in the last like three years, which no one seems to notice, at least the professionals that just like spam me. Um, and uh, you're going to see mistake four in just a minute. But anyway, um, you know, you need to you need to be speaking directly to these people. And I know that uh, into these organizations, I know that this seems obvious, but so many people mess this up. And so research, like do some digging. Don't Google it and then for 30 seconds. Spend If you spend five to seven minutes and you get good at researching organizations and you go and you read their mission statement, you go and look at who they have funded in the past. You go and see how long that grant has been around for. You go and figure out that this is the 20th anniversary of the grant, which maybe they didn't mention. You throw that in your application. I'm not talking about pandering here, and I'm not talking about like uh, about like marketing sleight of hand here. I'm just saying that it's pretty obvious when you take the time to really get to know the organization, and then that is going to enable you to not make mistake number one, which is centering it around your needs. And you absolutely have to make that you know you have to make that case right of of how you are going to use these funds, what you need them for, of course. But a lot of people stop there and they don't run it through the prism of what does this organization need the, their, their money to end up accomplishing. I'm telling you that's going to help you stand out instantly. If you only do that and then stop this right now, you are going to have a lot more success than you have had. Or you're going to be able to save yourself a lot of heartache if you have not yet started applying for grants. Mistake number three is that you are only applying to predictable places. Uh, this is similar to students who are seeking scholarships for college. Uh, I always, and very few students take me up on this, by the way, because this is not easy work. But uh, most students, and this goes for grants as well, but most students apply to the same scholarships. And I'm not talking about just to the school, like say outside of the school, right? 
They apply to the same places as all of the rest of the people who play their instrument and then just try to hope that they get chosen from that very predictable, those predictable places applying in predictable ways. Other people will apply to a grant, which again, has to, there has to be some overlap here on the organization's needs and your needs, of course. But if you apply to some grant that has actually never funded a musician before, However, they are funding things in your hometown or they are funding things specifically for uh, a kind of a, a large umbrella for people of a demographic that you check a box, etc. Then even if they almost always give it to, uh, to engineers, if they see a musician, they might very quickly say, we do not fund cello trios. And great. Uh, but they might say, wait a minute, this group checks all of the boxes and this is something completely new. And oh, by the way, we've been talking about expanding to blank. You're instantly going to stand out in a good way. Okay, the, the number one problem with grant proposals for most places, and this is absolutely true for Mockingbird because we get so many applications, is that there are so there's just the numbers are so large that even getting it across my desk is uh, is hard because by the time it makes it to the grant making committee we have a we have a subcommittee of volunteers who helps us and and every every proposal is seen by more than one person to make sure that that the great ones uh, don't fall through the tr cracks just because one person passed on it but it, it takes a lot to get it to the actual committee that decides yes or no and how much money. And that if you do, if you don't make any of these mistakes and you align with our needs as an organization, you are absolutely going to get through, <clears throat> excuse me, but we will sometimes get over a thousand applicants and sometimes we'll fund like 20 in a funding cycle. So uh, yeah, you, you do that math, right? That's like one in 500, right? Or one in 50. That was not good math. I was like, wow, that's really, yeah, one in uh, one in 50. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's not good. That's 2%. See, I just redeemed myself on the uh, incredibly easy math. So uh, go apply places where you're going to stand out. Now, here's the thing is that if you Googled uh, you know, places for a cello trio. I'm not sure why I'm thinking of, th I don't think I've ever heard a cello trio, but they're on my mind right now. Um, you know, un unpredictable places for a singer songwriter to apply for a grant proposal. Uh, whatever the first grant, whatever the first Google result is, is not going to be off the beaten path anymore because every person who Googles it is then going to see it and then going to go, oh, I found that, right? You have to get creative. You have to dig under some rocks. You have to end up getting rejected flat out by a whole bunch of them going, we don't fund that kind of thing. There just needs to be a little bit of daylight there and then you stand out and then you're the only person who's doing anything even remotely close to what you're doing. And so then the decision is simply, is this the kind of thing that we fund? And if they say, yes, you're in, it's not, okay, which of these thousand, because we, we, you know, we do get uh, grant proposals from uh, people that, uh, that do not qualify, uh, that, that um, it's, it's amazing. We don't have very many hoops that we have to jump through. And yet there's a lot of people who end up sending us requests that are not even eligible. Uh, but the vast majority are, and the, the problem is standing out. Okay, mistake number four. You are copy and pasting too much in your application. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that it is very obvious when there is just like a canned response to uh, tell me about your organization or tell me about your mission, etc. Sometimes, notice I didn't say mistake number four is that you are copy and pasting. I said you are copy and pasting too much, right? You should have a short, medium, long-term bio, a long-term, a uh, long-form bio um, for, uh, you know, ready to go. I have like my my EPK, which you can find at andrewhits.com slash EPK. I've got uh, a few different photos, like with tuba, without tuba. I have three different length of bios. Um, you know, it's, it's ready to go. Like when somebody asks me for one of those things, all I have to do is send them that link which I don't even have to look up. I just type it and then in the email and I'm done, right? So copy and pasting is good. However, 
when you end up copy and pasting just so that you can apply to more grants in a shorter period of time, uh, it ends up leading to two things. One is that there will be way too much information in some spots. There are absolutely some applications where you should go really deep on some specific question because it aligns with that organization's um, mission. And there are uh, other times when that is not the headline. If everything is the headline, nothing is the headline. Think of a book and you highlight an entire three pages in a row. Uh, when you highlight entire pages, it does not, uh, it doesn't really work very well, right? Um, that's when I first started highlighting when I was in like middle school. I just had yellow books and I was like, so now the book is just yellow, which doesn't really seem that helpful. And that's because it's not helpful. Uh, the other problem though, so there's too much information in some spots and there's not enough details in others because when this section over here is really important to this organization, that's when you actually want to uh, to, to bring attention to that and to actually add extra content. So uh, you want to make sure that you don't have too much where there can be a little bit. You want to keep things as tight as possible, but you also don't want to skimp when it's important. And the copy and pasting from, because a lot of grant proposals will ask the same questions or very, very similar questions. But when the wording is tweaked, your entry should be tweaked and you'll get better at this. And then lastly, mistake number five you aren't clearly and concisely articulating who will be changed if your grant is approved. Let me give you two examples. One will be from a school that is um, that you know checks the boxes that we look for. Uh, this could be um, a school. We don't have like set and hard criteria, but uh, as a member of grant making at the Mockingbird Foundation, I am very partial to schools that have a large percentage of free and reduced lunch students. Uh, I'm very, uh, you know, we, we, we tend to go with places that have, um, that there are just certain boxes, right? Socioeconomic boxes, which um, almost always lead to underfunded music programs. There's a there's like a direct correlation there uh, in my many 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 years of paying attention to this, uh, and so um, those are things that we that we look for. So here's a here's an example uh, that this grant is for uh, 16 ukuleles. Okay, to expand the ukuleles that we have for our ukulele class. Now here is the second version of this. Uh, we only have. 10 ukuleles for a 20 person class, which means that half the class isn't playing at even any given time. And our ukuleles are all over 15 years old. While they have been great for us, we have a $0 per year budget for repairs. So if one breaks, I must fix it with my own money if I am able. If I am not able, we are down to nine ukuleles until I can save enough to fix the broken one. So you tell me which of those is going to be a more compelling story, right? And this is the same teacher. This is the same situation, just two different ways to be able to describe this, right? If it's a school that doesn't have a lot of money in general, then of course their ukulele program is going to be underfunded and they're going to use those 16 ukuleles. There's no doubting that. However, the other one where half the class has to watch, right? So you're like limiting the instruction uh, of the of the teacher. Uh, and then also, so this is going to double the number of students that can participate at any given time. This is also going to help them because we don't have money for repairs. We, we can't give them ongoing money for that's not something that we would do. Uh, and so this actually providing them brand new ukuleles is going to help phase out some of those older ones or make it less pressing if there are now six extras, right? Because they have 16 they get, they get, uh, you know, they, they, they have 10, they request 16. There's 20 kids in the class. This is all obvious at this point, right? That's really compelling. And all that they did was talk about how things are going to be changed. And also they were able to demonstrate the fact that this teacher is incredibly dedicated, right? And, uh, in a way that they didn't say I'm incredibly dedicated, but in general, again, I'm just going with the numbers. At a lot of these schools, it tends to be younger teachers who are who are recently out of school, who are at least the ones at these schools who are applying for grants. A lot of them end up moving on to different schools, and a lot of them end up not being there for very long. 
Uh, sometimes we get grants from people who are in their 50s who have been there for 30 years. Like, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but in general, these are the patterns that I've noticed in the last, like, 14 years. I've got a lot of data here. Um, and, um, and so this is kind of like a striking while the iron's hot, while there's this super plugged in teacher where even if they leave within a year or two, uh, because younger people tend to have a lot of life changes and they tend to have more reasons to move to take care of aging people, or they end up getting married or etc. Uh, those ukuleles are staying behind. And even if this super energetic and, um, an assertive teacher moves on, these new ukuleles are going to, et cetera, right? So that's a very clear case for where our money is going to help, not just now, but moving forward for many years um, you know, from now. And so, boy, that is getting short stacked very, very quickly. So to review, mistake number one, you are centering it around your needs rather than the needs of the organization you are applying to. Mistake number two, you aren't spending enough time researching the grant specifically and the organization. Mistake number three, you are only applying to predictable places. Mistake number four, you are copy and pasting too much in your application. And mistake number five, you aren't clearly and concisely articulating who will be changed if your grant is approved. Okay, this week's quote is from Aretha Franklin, one of my favorite artists of all time. Quote, it really is an honor if I can be inspirational to a younger singer or person. It means I've done my job. You don't have to be the queen of soul to inspire the people coming up after you, although it, it certainly doesn't hurt. I can still remember the first time I heard Rock Steady, the drum break in Rock Steady, and then she started like really screaming after that, and it just like it blew my mind. I like my I could feel my brain getting rewired as I was listening to that song for the first time. But you don't have to be Aretha Franklin to inspire people. Simply having the courage to show up and be heard is enough to inspire younger musicians, younger entrepreneurial musicians. Just having the courage to try something new, saying that private lessons are not, or lessons are not just private, one-on-one, -on -one, same time every week. I don't care what it is. Just having the courage to be different is enough to inspire younger musicians. And displaying that courage is something that is available to each and every one of us every single day, including today. Thank you very much to all of you for watching, subscribing to this YouTube channel, uh, which I'm trying to get my subscriptions up. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Good luck with applying to grants. And by the way, I could have said mistake number six is not applying to any grants. Do it. People have money in you. When you bother an organization like mine, you are helping us because we can't just keep collecting money. We will actually get in trouble if we keep collecting money and not paying it out. You're doing us a favor if you are the right fit for one of our grants. You're actually taking a problem off of our to-do list by bothering us for money. So don't feel selfish doing that. Follow those five mistakes or don't follow them. Don't make them and you're going to get a lot more traction than if you do. Thank you and I will see you next week. Peace.